Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the December 2nd of 2020 uh, meeting of the UTA Board of Trustees. Uh, we are um, streaming uh, live, but have certainly invited the public to join us. And uh, if the public has uh, entered through our uh, link and wish to speak, uh, when we come time for public comment, we would um, uh, ask that you raise use the raise the hand feature, and that would let us know that you'd like to make a, a comment. Um, I'm joined uh, today uh, by my colleagues Beth Holbrook and Jeff Acerson, and um, we'll first go to uh, our Safety First Minute, and with that, we'll welcome uh, Sheldon Shaw. Good morning, Sheldon. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, trustees. As always, appreciate the opportunity. As we move into winter time, my thoughts are turn to slips, trips, and falls, which are a leading cause of injury and death in the workplace each year. In fact, according to the National Safety Council, the cost of those slips, trips, and falls is around $70 billion a year in the United States. It's an all-hands effort to try and help prevent those. If you see that there's a spill in a hallway, let's make sure that gets taken care of. If there are things like cables or power lines or obstructions that are that are in walkways, let's make sure those get cleared up. If if there's a um, you know, so there's a trip hazard where there's a hole or a crack, let's get those um, reported so that we can address those. And this is a time of year when you need to think about what kind of footwear you're selecting as you come to and from work. And finally, for all our facilities, we have ice and snow melt that's out in front of the doorways so we can all be part of the effort to make sure those are kept clear and safe for employees coming to and from work. As always, I thank, thank you for the opportunity, Chair. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, great, great and timely advice. Uh, any public comment that was uh, received previously was distributed to the board. Jenna, do we have anybody from the public that wishes to make comment in today's meeting? Chair, I do not see any hands raised of okay. public members. Um, oh. But order, we did not do the electronic board meeting determination. Uh, that would be great. Would you mind uh, reading that for us, Jana? I'd be happy to, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so this is the electronic board meeting determination uh, due to our remote meeting circumstances. Consistent with provisions of the Utah Open and Public Meetings Act, specifically Utah Code 52-4-207, subsection 4, and acting in my capacity as the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Utah Transit Authority, I hereby make the following written determinations in support of my decision to hold and convene electronic meetings of the UTA Board without a physical anchor location. One, con conducting board and board committee meetings with an anchor location that is physically accessible for members of the public to attend in person presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. This determination is based upon the following facts, among others. The COVID-19 pandemic is ongoing and significant community can, and continued community person-to-person -person virus transmission continues to occur in the state of Utah and federal, state, and local health authorities have adopted guidelines for the general public and businesses which encourage institutions and individuals to take precautions, including limiting in-person interactions and recommending increased virtual interactions. This written determination takes effect November 11th, 2020, and is in effect until midnight on November, on December 11th, 2020, um, and may be reissued by future written determinations of the board, chair of the board at that or any other appropriate time, dated the 6th day of November, 2020, Carlton J. Christensen. Thanks, Jenna. Appreciate you uh, catching that. Uh, again, if there are any uh, members of the public that want to uh, speak and, and um, we just somehow miss you. Uh, if you would just ra use the raise the hand feature, we can certainly come back to you. Um, last Monday, uh, late Monday afternoon, the Utah State S Senate consented to the governor's appointment of Mr. Jeff Acerson as a trustee for the Utah Transit Authority. So um, with that, we'll invite Stephanie Withers to administer the oath of office to Jeff. Stephanie? Good morning, board. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, if you will please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Jeff Acerson, do solemnly swear. Thank you. 
Jeff, I think you're on mute. There you go. I'm unmuted now. Go ahead. Okay. I, Jeff Acerson, do solemnly swear. I, Jeff Acerson, do solemnly swear. That I will support, obey, and defend. That I will support, obey, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this state. And the Constitution of this state. And that I will discharge the duties of my office. And that I will discharge the duties of my office. As trustee for the Utah Transit Authority. As trustee for the Utah Transit Authority. With fidelity. With fidelity. Congratulations, Jeff. Thank I'll you. Give you a virtual round of applause there, Jeff. So am I the first to be virtually confirmed? I mean, this is this is kind of a new horizon, isn't it? Uh, it is. We we have sworn in a few uh, of our chief officers uh, online, but um, the first board member for sure. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. We certainly look forward to going or working with you. Um, Jeff, is there anything you wanted to say? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, we're good. You know, meetings, let's move forward. I'm ready to run full speed ahead. Thank you, Great. Chair. Well, with that, we'll uh, um, go to our consent motion, which includes approval of our regular board meeting on November the 11th, as well as our public hearing also held on November 11th. With that, I would entertain a motion on our consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as outlined. I second that motion, Mr. Chair. I have a motion by Beth, seconded by Jeff. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes, thank you. Uh, next up will be our uh, agency report, and with that we'll turn to our executive director, Carolyn Gannott. Good morning, aye. Carolyn. Good morning. Um, I just have a couple items today. Um, one is I'm gonna have Eddie start out, Eddie Cummings, our Chief Operations Officer, to actually give a little bit of an update on ski service, which started up on Sunday. So I'm gonna turn it over to Eddie. Good morning. Um, Salt Lake County Ski Service began on Sunday. Brighton and Alta were open on Sunday and uh, Snowboard opened on Monday. We uh, Solitude is tentatively scheduled to open on December 7th. As you know, to ensure the safety of our ski bus, we're doing things a little differently this year, including providing socially distanced uh, lines at bus stops and requiring masks at all times. We're also limiting the loads on our buses to 20 passengers. So far, things are going extremely well. Uh, during the first three days of service, we've not had any major issues. Our maximum load was 17 riders on Sunday and 20 riders on Monday, and yesterday's ridership was similar. Uh, Snowbird usually hires a few international workers who use the ski bus. Uh, this year, they decided not to hire those workers, so we're seeing a decrease in, in employee ridership. Um, this will likely be helpful for us, though, in helping manage loads early in the mornings. Um, our efforts to ensure safety on ski bus service has received a good amount of media attention as recently as last weekend. And our communication team has been doing a great job with website information, blogs, emails, text, and social media posts. Uh, a digital mobile online campaign is now underway and will run through the opening of all of our resorts. Uh, we'll also be conducting some, uh, some rider education events at several of our park and ride lots. On December 5th and 11th, the team will be in Salt Lake County. On December 12th and 18th, the team will be up north uh, for the Weber and Davis County services. And then on December 19th, the team will be in Orem for our Utah County service. Any questions about ski service? Eddie, are you finding uh, that the public is understanding sort of what's expected of them and sort of where to go and uh, did our media um, sort of introduction to it help in those first few days, or are there a lot of lessons learned from that experience? Yeah, things are going really well. So far, everybody's complied. Um, we've received a lot of, you know, it's just worked extremely well so far. You know, obviously, we're going to see ridership pick up, um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll deal with those challenges as they come. But so far, so good. Things are going really well. Great. 
Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board, though? Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to thank Eddie and his team and um, our um, outreach team as well, Andrea Packer and her team, I mean, for really getting out there and, and organizing this as well. So I really want to appreciate everybody who has worked on this. I think it was a, a smooth opening for a different way we were running ski service. So I appreciate that. Um, the second item I want to talk about is FTA's um, real-time trans information rolling stock condition assessment grant that we received through the FTA program. I um, you know, about six weeks ago, we won another grant um, that was a through a demonstration program through FTA, which was the Rail Trespass and Suicide Prevention um, Grant through their Safety Research and Demonstration Program. This time we were doing it through the Assets um, Management uh, Demonstration Program. So I wanna um, have Hal give a presentation. Hal was instrumental in pulling this together, working with the operations team. So I'm going to have him give a little bit of a presentation about what this uh, demonstration program is about and that we were selected to receive $338,155. That was actually one of uh, six grants awarded and we were one of the higher grants that were awarded. So Hal, I'm going to turn this over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, good morning, everybody. So um, as Carolyn noted, this is a, a grant we received from FTA and the focus of the project is to be able to better uh, monitor the condition of our track and rail. Uh, some, uh, could you advance the next slide? Um, so the project is a public-private partnership that came together through um, the University of Utah and Autofill. Autofill is a company out of the Netherlands, um, and it was a uh, it was a nice coming together. Autofill um, met with us through EDC Utah. Um, about a year ago, and they had developed um, software to monitor uh, the condition of vehicles. And uh, and primarily they were targeting uh, rental cars to be able to monitor the condition of cars when they come in and out. But um, as we talked with them, we thought about a number of different other applications for the technology uh, they had developed. And uh, with the camera technology and uh, software they developed to monitor the condition of um, of uh, physical assets. Um, so you can do the next slide. Um, so the project would, um, basically the way it'll work is uh, we'll mount uh, cameras um, on the rail car, a specific rail car, and uh, what we'll use um, infrared um, cameras. And what happens um, as the sun comes up in the morning and the rail and the track um, heat, it provides a specific heat signature and the cameras and the equipment will be able to monitor um, that heat signature. And if there's defects in the track or changes in the track, uh, we'll be able to identify those defects. So if there's a defect, it doesn't heat um, normally. And so it's, um, you're able to see it through the infrared camera. So it's able to spot a lot of things that you couldn't see through a visual or even a magnetic inspection. So it's, uh, a uh, really great application of the technology and autofill will be providing kind of the um, technology to monitor um, the track and be able to compare uh, scans, multiple scans of the track and equipment. Um, so you can do the next slide. Um, so the benefits of this uh, system is um, we'll hopefully improve rail safety um, and we will also be able to um, hopefully uh, reduce costs um, on rail uh, track inspections and be able to provide a lot more data um, for the operations group on the condition of the track and the ties. Um, and you can do the last slide. So um, the, the team that will be working on it is um, Autofill, who I mentioned, the international company, as well as uh, Peter Zhao. Uh, he's a PhD at the University of Utah. We've done a number of different projects uh, with Peter uh, over the years. And so we're excited to have this uh, great collaboration come together. It should be noted that um, local match uh, for the project will be coming through um, in-kind and cash donations from University of Utah and Autofill. So uh, really excited about the project. Happy to answer any questions. Oh, oh go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, one one um, question. I Oh, sorry, Beth, you go ahead, no, no, please. You go ahead. 
Okay. <laughs> We're like those little uh, chipmunks or whatever. Now, <laughs> uh, um, do you, um, uh, is, is this technology actually in use elsewhere or are they basically developing it as part of this project? Um, auto I mean, I realize the equipment's been around, but. Yeah, Autofill's developed the technology and they're they're using it in uh, Europe in, in a number of different um, applications. And so this will be, and like, as I mentioned, they're primarily targeting rent, the rental car industry. And so um, basically what they would do is scan the cars when they would come in and out and be able to monitor the condition. And, you know, Peter had developed this um, infrared scanning technology but it wasn't it was just a one-off so you could go and it didn't have the recording function so it's really a, a coming together of of two different um uh, technologies to be able to develop something that uh, will be more um, useful for uta and if you know the, assuming this works well we'll be able to um you know it has other applicability like we could potentially also scan and monitor the uh, cat catenary systems as well. So we're right now focusing on the rails and the ties as a as a proving uh, ground for this um, coming together. So Hal, thank you. Um, I think th this is uh, well done. Congratulations. Um, I did have a question because they are kind of using this in a slightly different capacity than the rental car industry. Um, does it so the first time that they that it's installed on our on one of our trains, does it is that like the first image and then that is um basically that's what subsequently it goes it gets compared to is that kind of how that works yeah we'll be able to um run multiple scans with the the technology so we'll be able to run you know run it for days on end and be able to kind of monitor it and then over time we can uh, monitor any changes in the in the rail as well so it kind of enables us to um, identify any things that we can't see now and then ultimately be able to um, have a great record and be able to check the condition of the track and the ties um, over a long period of time. And I just had in one other question, just I, I would assume that this is obviously for front runner, but is this also applicable for tracks? It's the same principles, is that correct? Yeah, we could use it on either system. Right now we're primarily um, thinking of it for front runner. Um, but we could use it on the light rail as well. Great, thank you. Congratulations again. Nice work. Yeah, this is this is a fun one to work on. So, any other questions for Hal? Well, congrats. I echo those words and congratulations, Hal, and and to the team. So. Carlton, the last thing I have is just to say, give another shout out to Hal and his team and the rest of at UTA. They did win a award that Utah Clean Cities gave out this year, um, primarily for the future of alternative fuels. So, um, and he was there um, accepting it as well last week with me. So, oh, there it is. There's our award. <laughs> so, and that's continued work. So anyways, um, I want to just thank him and the team. And I know a lot of Eddie's staff, uh, the, the operations team work on that as well. So anyways, I uh, shout out to Hal as well on that one. Yeah, con congratulations and, and uh, thanks to the whole team for getting us to this point. We'll look for good results and what we learned from this opportunity. So thank you. Uh, Carolyn, I assume that concludes. Okay. Yes. yes. Great. Um, that'll take us to uh, resolutions in, uh, on section seven. First item up is a resolution approving the capital project plan for the Mid Valley Connector Bus Rapid uh, Transit Project, and I know we've had some updates in the local advisory council. Uh, Mary, anything new that you want to add to this? Um, just just to remind you that the Mid Valley Connector Project is a seven mile BRT project that extends from the Mary Central Station to Salt Lake Community College, and then to the West Valley Track Station. We had presented the plan, the capital plan for the project to the Board of Trustees on November 4th, then to the Local Advisory Committee on November 18th, and the Local Advisory Committee at their last meeting recommended um, recommended the plan for approval by the Board of Trustees. So we're just back here now asking you to approve the capital project plan for the Mid Valley Connector project. Great. Any uh, questions for Mary? 
Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on this resolution. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve R 2020-12-01, the resolution approving the capital project plan for the Mid Valley Connector Bus Rapid Transit Project. I second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, uh, seconded um, by Jeff. I'll uh, ask uh, Janet, to, or I'll ask for a roll call. Trustee Avery. Yes. Trustee Holbrook. Aye. Chair Christensen. Yes. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. I just um, want to um, make a quick note on this. With the resolution and with the approval by the board, we will be submitting a project development application for the small starts over the next month or so into the Federal Transit Administration. So this allows us to move forward on seeking this federal funds as a portion of this project. So you know, thank you for the approval. Sure, and I think it's fair to say, or we recognize that it'll be difficult to move forward with the project without the help of the federal government. And so we, we remain very optimistic, but uh, thanks for that work. And we'll look forward to hopefully some good news. Um, next item up is also a resolution adopting the authorities uh, 2021 through 2025 capital plan. And with that, we'll come back to Mary Delorado. Mary. Thank you. Um, so as a reminder, the five-year capital plan includes all new construction and capital improvement projects, state of good repair activities, major equipment purchases, and other special projects requiring expenditures of over $25,000. We took the draft five-year plan, we presented it to the board here on um, August 26th for review. Then we took it to the local advisory council on September 16th for their review and approval or their consultation, I should say. Um, and they, they agreed with the plan. However, since that time, we made some changes, several updates to the plan. And so we came back to the board on October 28th and showed you those changes and then back to the advisory council on November 18th with those changes. The local advisory council reviewed the updated plan and recommended that for approval by the board. So we're back here today for your final approval of the five-year capital plan. Um, once approved, the 2021 capital budget within that plan will be incorporated into UTA's overall 2021 budget. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Just wanted to say thank you for all of your hard work on this. I think that this has, this is a really um, great way to kind of go forward on this. So thank you. Thanks. Um, certainly the revisions were timely and a good time to make those changes as well. So thank you for that effort. Um, seeing no other discussion, I would entertain a motion on this resolution. Chair, uh, this is uh, Commissioner Asus and I would make the motion to approve R 2020-12-02 resolution adopting the authorities 2021-25 capital plan. Second. I have a motion from uh, Trustee Acerson and a second by Trustee uh, Holbrook. Um, any other discussion? Seeing none, I would ask for a roll call. Trustee Aether. Aye. Trustee Holbrook. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous, thank you. Okay. Our next item up is a resolution approving the amended charter for the Community Advisory Committee. And with that, we welcome um, Megan Waters. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, so just a reminder, uh, we're talking about the what was originally formed as the Citizen Advisory Board. And this committee was formed in 2017 as a result of SB 174. Um, since that time, the, the board is no longer statutorily required. However, we would like to maintain its existence and it adds a lot of value in terms of community collaboration and, and perspectives from community members. So we have made several updates to the charter uh, really to align with 
the Committee on Accessible Transportation, as well as the goals of the Community Engagement Department, um, and also better reflect how the committee has evolved over the past couple of years. So the first um, update that we'd like to share in the charter is that the, the Citizen Advisory Board will be first reclassified to a committee and be renamed to the Community Advisory Committee, um, so the acronym CAC. Um, in addition to this renaming and reclassification, the updates to the charter include some revised language around the process for nominations, as well as selection of committee members working through nominating organizations. We've also, with the formation of the Community Engagement Department, this committee fits really well with our goals. And so we'll, we will, the Community Engagement Department will serve as staff liaison to the Community Advisory Committee. The charter has also been updated to better outline um, expectations of members, as well as their kind of the term limits they'll serve and participation in quarterly meetings. Uh, we've also revised some of the expectations of officer positions and clarified that in the charter, as well as some revised procedural guidelines, um, rules of order, just to strike a balance for, um, for the committee procedures. So these, these changes have all been um, discussed with the committee and they were heavily involved in the update of the charter. And so we would, we would just like to move forward with the, with the updates. Do y'all have any questions about the charter update? Megan, can you give me a sense of how many uh, number of uh, members of the committee and, and, and just sort of a general makeup of where they would be pulled from? Yes. So the, the charter states that there there's room for 12 active members on the committee. Right now we have five, so there are about seven positions to fill. Um, we have in the past, there has been a list of nominating organizations maintained by UTA to reflect, to help us get representation from the community um, to, re to represent a diverse geographic spread, um, a diverse population um, transit users. Um, so, so we want to get a good representation and inclusive representation on the committee. So the process has been for those nominating organizations to provide us a nominee and then um, those those individuals would be interviewed and selected for the committee and we are we are updating the nominating organization list just to make sure um, we have we have good good representation inclusive representation on the committee and we'll be soliciting nominations from those organizations in the next um, couple of months thank you uh, other questions though from the board so i, I have a question uh do you see in this process, is there a level of excitement of participation? Do they feel like it's a great opportunity to help shape and give feedback to UTA? Yes, I, I think there is, we have a small, as I said, there are five active members right now, but they're very engaged in the meetings we do have. Um, they have a lot of ideas to share and, and some of their priorities have really been for, for there to be a diverse representation on the committee, as well as um, to promote sort of um, collaboration within the committee to have an opportunity to speak with UTA staff, um, share their ideas, and do that in kind of a collaborative and collective way. So I, I see excitement. I see a great value add for the community engagement um, goals of, of UTA as well. I, I would love to see uh, as we uh, populate that committee or that group, as ideas come forward and if there is an implementation of those ideas on behalf of UTA, I would love to see us have some form of recognition to those individuals that somehow brought those ideas to the forefront and allowed us to better create, better uh, serve our customers. I think that's I a think wonderful. Sorry. Sorry, Tracy Holbrook. No, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, I, I wanted to commend Megan and all of her efforts. Um, the committee is actually quite enthusiastic and I've I've really come to get some perspective of, of what their backgrounds are and they are very diverse and so far and I know that we can just continue to build on that. And again, thank you, Megan. You did a fantastic job of really getting everything coordinated. So I just wanted to congratulate you on that. Thank you, Trustee Holbrook. Thanks for your guidance as well. Any other questions or comments? 
Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on the resolution. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve R 2020-12-03, the resolution approving the amended charter for the Community Advisory Committee. I'll second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by uh, Jeff. I'll ask for a roll call. Trustee Acerson. Aye. Trustee Albrecht. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks again, Megan, for your work on that. Thank you. Our, our next uh, resolution for consideration is a resolution adopting the 2021 EcoPath um, air structure for the agency. And with that, we'll turn to Monica Morton. Good morning, Monica. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Trustee Holbrook, and welcome, Trustee Acerson. Um, I'll be discussing the resolution and seeking approval today to give you a background on October 21st, resolution R2020-10-02 was adopted. And that basically rescinded the reduced fare agreements found in the prior resolution. And part of the reduced fare agreements are our EcoPass programs. And these programs make passes available to institutions and businesses wanting to subsidize their employees' transit fare. Since that resolution was rescinded, we are presenting a new resolution for approval that will adopt the EcoPass fare structure of the agency. This will allow the fares team to begin renewing agreements with our current partners for 2021, as well as to continue to offer these programs to new partners throughout the year. Next slide, please. I will go over the main sections of the resolution. There's Exhibit A, and that is the fare pricing structure itself. Exhibit B is the associated contract template. The resolution also provides for the execution of contracts that are over 2,000, 200,000 in revenue, and that is if they remain within the parameters set forth in these exhibits. It also requires contracts falling outside of these parameters to be brought directly to you for approval, regardless of the dollar value. And then the last part of this resolution in recognition of the COVID-19 impacts to ridership during 2020, this resolution provides concession to our current annual eco partners if they renew in 2021. And I do just wanna emphasize that we value our partnerships with businesses, organizations, and institutions for many reasons. And one of them is because of their desire to subsidize transit, either fully or partially for their groups because they support it. And past programs are an incentive for them. And in return, they show our support to their commitment. And so it is a win-win. Next slide, please. The fair pricing structure has changed for 2021, along with some of the participation parameters. There will be four programs valid on premium service, but that will exclude paratransit, ski, and our Park City service. The programs include our annual preferred program. That's $330 for companies purchasing 100 passes or more, and they do have to purchase for their entire employee population. Our annual select program is $599 per employee. Our monthly program is $59, and our daily program is $6.40. Next slide, please. So to conclude my presentation, I'll go over the concessions. Our annual preferred and select partners, they were impacted most by COVID-19. So they paid for annual passes at the beginning of the year prior to the onset of the pandemic. And since many of their employees were urged to work from home, ridership decreased and annual pass usage dropped significantly. And as I mentioned, we do value our relationships with them. And in recognition of the COVID impact on our annual pass usage and to encourage them to subsidize transit again in 2021. We are reducing the price of the annual passes. Uh, the pricing option is available for our 2020 annual partners if they renew in another annual program in 2021. And that pricing is $275 a pass per year for preferred and annual select is $499 a pass per year. The fiscal impact of this program is estimated revenue of approximately 3.2 million for 2021, which is about 3.2 million less than we estimate revenue for 2020. 
to be, which is 6.4 million. And again, this is just for our eco pass revenue and the loss doing uh, the loss being to COVID-19 impacts. It should be noted that 3.2 million in 2021 is approximately 600,000 more than the projected um, projections in the tentative budget. And that increase was simply because we had more updated assumptions. We refined our estimates and we had a little bit better numbers to work with. So with that being said, do you have any additional questions or questions for me that I can answer on this resolution for you? Monica, can you give me an idea of like currently how many people would be in each of, or how many companies or entities would be in each of those past programs? Do you have a rough idea? Yeah, so we're looking at approximately um, between 95 to 100 partners. Um, to give you an example, our daily partners, we have about 20 participating. Our monthly partners ranges, but it's about 24 to 25. Um, annual select is as well about 25 and then we've got um, about 28 partners uh, participating annual preferred program. So it's split a little bit um, of each, but that's that's the breakdown. And then my uh, follow up question is aside from the, the concession, which I would concur, it's always easier to keep a customer. And, and work with them. And, and certainly if they're committed, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to make the concession. Is the the standard rate though uh, that you showed on the slide prior to that, is that about what they're paying today or is that a little bit more, a little bit less? It is less than they're paying today, yes. So both this new, the new pricing is less and then the concession is also less. Okay. And the idea behind less on the new pricing is that just to draw more into the program then? I mean, is that the purpose? I, I'm i not opposed to it. I'm just wondered how you got to a, lower, a little bit lower yeah, amount. Absolutely. So to give you a background, when we price our eco programs, we use data collected from our EFC system. Okay. And it's it's extremely rich, right? It's got a lot of um, data, that, including the retail value. And so what we had to do, given this situation, we looked at what we, we looked at the past couple months, what ridership is doing. We also did some projections into 2021. We know ridership will stay down, but we did some projections into 2021. And it's not an exact science, but we did uh, figure that people would be riding less and we still want to give our partners a discount. And so based on those formulas and some estimates, it did bring the pricing down. Okay, that makes sense. Um, questions though from the board, any questions? Um, Monica, I had a question. Oh, um, thanks. Do, do we, um, I'm assuming that you're going to be monitoring um, how this is going to progress, maybe like in the middle of next year, maybe even quarterly. Um, is there going to be kind of an, will you be able to give us an update as to how this is going? Absolutely. Yes, I'm happy to give you an update and we are watching. We're still watching. We have been watching. We'll continue to watch throughout, you know, the first quarter and the second quarter. We're monitoring these programs all the time, but I do want to emphasize there's flexibility in the contract. If, if something, if we need to shift for some reason, more flexible. Yeah, that was the question I was going to ask. Possibly if there's a tiered pricing, if, if we find that ridership uh, and being optimistic, if ridership really increases tremendously, is there that uh, flexibility to renegotiate or to reconsider what the actual cost is? So that was my question. Yes, there is there is flexibility, and if ridership, you know, ends up pivoting the opposite way and just goes through the roof, obviously that brings the discounts higher. But we can sit back down together and say, okay, is is the discount reasonable? If it isn't, what would we have to adjust the pricing to? Typically, um, you know, our companies and our partners want to know what to budget for. And so it, it it's not the best practice to go back to them mid-year on annual prices to do adjustments, but we can follow that. And if we feel like there needs to be a change, absolutely, we can do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, being none, I would entertain a motion on this resolution. Chair, I'd be uh, like to make the motion uh, to approve 
R2020-12-04, resolution adopting the 2021 eco pass fare structure of the agency. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth um, on the resolution. I'll ask for a roll call. Trustee Acers. Aye. Trustee Holbrook. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Monica. Thanks for um, um, putting this together and bringing it to it. I think it'll make it easier for staff and certainly for us as well. So thank you. And please let them know of our appreciation for their continued support. I, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Will do. Thank you. Um, we'll move uh, to the next item, which is a resolution authorizing the financing of transit vehicles through an equipment lease purchase agreement, uh, as well as uh, related matters. And with that, we welcome Emily Diaz. Good morning, Emily. Good morning, Chair. Thanks for having me. Um, so as a reminder, in February of 2020, the Board of Trustees passed a resolution 2020-02-01, which declared UTA's intent to reimburse itself for capital expenditures for up to the 2020 budgeted amount of just over $30 million. Um, at that time, UTA anticipated acquiring almost 130 vehicles to include 46 bus, 30 paratransit, and 50 vanpool vans. Due to COVID-19, um, several manufacturers have been unable to maintain the production levels, and um, so some of the production had to be pushed out to 2021. Because of that, the amount of vehicles was decreased to 80 to include 20 bus, 25 paratransit, and 35 van pool vans. Um, and the total lease amount is now just under 13 million. In July of this year, UTA issued an RFP for um, six and 14 year lease financing um, with JP Morgan bidding at the lowest rates. So um, the resolution grants the executive director, treasurer and comptroller of the authority to take all the necessary steps to execute the lease purchase agreements with an aggregate principal amount not more than 12,590,000 and to bear interest at a rate not to exceed two and a half percent. With that, do you have any questions? Emily, I assume the six year window is for the smaller paratransit vehicles and then the 12 year or larger buses, correct? Correct. And it's actually, it's a 14 year for the 14 bus. Year. Correct. Okay. And um, any questions, however, from the board? Uh, not seeing any. Um, and I know that we've uh, discussed this in the past and certainly you've had this come to us in the past. Um, with that, I'll entertain a motion on the resolution. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve R2020-12-05, the resolution authorizing the financing of transit vehicles through equipment lease purchase agreements and related matters. I'll second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, um, on the resolution. I'll ask for a roll call. Trustee Hager. Aye. Trustee Holbrook. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Appreciate Thanks. you and the rest of the staff's work on it. Um, we've moved to Section 8 in our agenda, which is contracts, disbursements, and grants. And with that, we'll, um, we have a software maintenance agreement um, on our Oracle J.D. Edwards with uh, Mythics, I think is how you pronounce that. And with that, we'll turn to Dan Harmouth and Dave Snyder. Good morning, Dan and Dave. Morning. Good morning, Chairman and Trustees. Um, as you mentioned, I'm joined by Dave Snyder, who's the manager of Enterprise Systems, a new position uh, as of a couple months ago. So if there's any detailed questions I can't answer, Dave will be able to answer that as he was the one that negotiated this uh, contract. So we recommend uh, that the board approves uh, extending our Oracle JD Edwards software maintenance contract for five years. This will allow UTA to receive updates for our JD Edwards ERP system. ERP is Enterprise Resource Planning System, uh, which will include all future enhancements, bug fixes, and security patches. 
the Oracle JD, JD Edwards uh, ERP system is used by all UTA business units and most employees uh, for payroll, accounts receivable, uh, accounts payable, uh, the general ledger, procurement, inventory management, asset management, maintenance work orders, human resources, and other modules. And so that's what makes this the enterprise resource planning system. Um, so this contract is with, Myth with, with Mythics. Mythics is an Oracle reseller through the Utah State contract AR867. Uh, through Mythics, uh, this contract is structured for five years at a fixed price of $206,172.55. Typically, Oracle raises a maintenance annually by 3 to 4%. So with this total value of the contract at a million dollars a million dollars and, and thirty thousand eight hundred sixty two dollars uta will realize over five years a savings of seventy three thousand four hundred seventy eight dollars because it's a fixed price contract for five years and there will be no four percent uh, annual increases this contract time frame is again for five years. It'll be billed on a quarterly basis. And so uh, we recommend approval of this contract and we're open to any questions that you may have. Yep. The only question I had, Dan, and it, um, more out of curiosity, are there other sort of state affiliated agencies that are on JD Edwards or is the sort of contract they have just on any Oracle product? The contract is for any Oracle product. Uh, there really isn't that we know of any agencies on JD Edwards. JD Edwards is sort of uh, a system that is, has been leapfrogged by other Oracle ERP systems. Uh, the state is on another ERP system that's not Oracle. Uh, so, uh, I don't know of any other state agencies on JD Edwards, but this contract is for any Oracle system services software. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, any questions, however, from the board on this contract? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on uh, this contract. Chair, I'd uh, uh, go ahead and make the motion to approve contract as presented in the meeting materials. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Thanks, Dan, and thanks, Dave, uh, for your work Thank you. on it. Thank you. Uh, next uh, uh, contract up is with uh, Merchant Services with Chase Payment Tech, and we welcome uh, Bill Green and, and uh, Troy Bingham. Actually, Mr. Uh, Chair, this is Todd Mills. I'm going to oh. be uh, introducing this contract. Sorry okay. about that. No, no, that's uh, okay. I saw your <laughs> name there. It was crossed out. So. Oh, yeah. A little confusion, but uh, uh -huh. I'll give you a little background on this contract first to let you know kind of how we got to where we're at. Uh, so since 2007, UTA has used a company called TSIS to provide credit card processing services at all UTA ticket vending machines. Uh, Chase Payment Tech is the merchant service provider who had a contract with TSIS for merchant service processing of card transactions. In late August, UTA was notified that the contract between Chase Payment Tech and TSIS was going to expire on September 30th. UTA attempted to extend the TSIS contract to avoid service interruption, but was unsuccessful. In mid-September, we reached out to Chase Payment Tech to determine if they had the technical capacity to seamlessly transition merchant services and ensure uninterrupted service at UTA TVMs. Uh, Chase Payment Tech was able to quickly assume all merchants pro merchant processing functions, and UTA was able to continue uninterrupted credit card processing uh, by utilizing an existing State of Utah contract with Chase Payment Tech. The transaction has been successful and was seamless to our customers. Uh, in 2021, UTA will issue a competitive RFP seeking a five-year contract for merchant services. Utilizing the current State of Utah contract will allow UTA to continue merchant services until a new contract can be bid and executed. 
the estimated cost for these services is sixty-six thousand dollars for 2020 and two hundred sixty-three thousand five hundred dollars for 2021 for a total value of three hundred twenty-nine thousand five hundred dollars. We request the board to ratify the purchase order to Chase Payment Tech and authorize the service to continue through December 31st of 2021. I do have uh, Bill Green and Emily Diaz on the line as well to assist with any qu specific questions you might have. Uh, the only question I had, uh, Todd, and, and, uh, is is that fixed price based upon an estimated um, usage pattern or or is it like a lot of credit cards where you're charged based on the transaction? Yeah, so it's based on usage, but it's a per transaction fee. And so we've estimated based on our past history usage, what that's going to be. Okay, so it could be potentially less, you know, with ridership being down. Yeah, and we have erred on the uh, side of, uh, you know, a little extra just to make sure that we're, we're on the heavy side. Bill, you were gonna say something? Something, uh, oh, I think Bill got preempted by Jeff. Uh, <laughs> Or the, I, or I didn't have Jeff. a question. <laughs> um, so, so when um, when we go go through this RFP process, is the principle still the same that we would do? It would. That's probably what's generally out there. Is there's a, a minimum type of transaction, and then it's a cost per transaction. Is that is that typical for this service? I just want to make sure I understand that because that's what I think, but I want to understand more. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to defer to Bill and Emily, maybe to answer that. So, yes, that's actually very typical of these types of services. Um, there's merchant service fees, and then there's also uh, credit card interchange fees that are applicable. Great, thank you. That was my only question. So I just wanted to make sure that that's exactly how I understood it. So, whoa, we're good. <laughs> well, and it sounds like we're fortunate that they could step in in such a timely way and the state had a contract with them that we could utilize. Yeah, it was a little yeah. touch and go there for a minute, but uh, the state contract uh, definitely helped us out. Okay. Uh, seeing no other comment, I, I would entertain a motion to ratify this contract uh, slash purchase order. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we ratify and approve the merchant services with Chase Payment Tech. Oh wait, sorry, just approve. Did I just say ratify? I apologize. I heard no, ratify is appropriate because okay. they commenced it a few months ago. Great, thank you. Um, my original motion as stated, ratify. And I will ratify and approve and second and all that good stuff. <laughs> thank you. Okay. That's a second. <laughs> we, we have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, to go ahead and ratify the uh, uh, purchase. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, thanks, uh, Todd. Thanks, Emily, on that. Thank you. Next order, item up is a change order for snow removal service extension with Roth Landscaping. And with that, we welcome Eddie Cummings and Kevin Anderson. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. This is a contract with Roth Landscaping for snow removal services at 30 Salt Lake County locations. Um, properties include track stations, park and ride lots, and the West Valley Intermodal Hub. Sidewalks and up to the train platforms are also included in the contract. Um, due to training requirements, UTA facilities maintenance employees will continue to perform the snow removal task on the actual train platforms. Uh, we are requesting to exercise the first one-year option on this contract. The cost for the one-year extension is $150,687. Uh, just a little background on this contract. The original contract was for three years with two one-year options and was executed in 2017 before the current uh, UTA Board of Trustees were in place. Uh, the total estimated cost of the five-year contract at the time was $850,000. To date, the total amount spent for the first three years has been $452,060. The average, average annual expenditures has been $150,687, which is the estimated amount for the one-year extension. This amount will obviously depend uh, a great deal on the actual snowfall that we experienced this winter. The one-year extension will bring the contract value to $602,746, and this will leave $247,254 
uh, for the second year option on the five year $850,000 contract. Any questions? Eddie, just confirming at this point, we're not approving the second year extension, right? No, not we? this time. This is just the one year extension. Okay. Unfortunately, we're not using a lot of uh, snow removal yet. I, uh, anyway, we hope that one day we'll get some snow, but uh, any questions, however, on this extension? Uh, seeing none, I would entertain a motion on this change order. Okay, I recommend the motion to uh, to approve the service extension for this uh, next year. Second, apologies. Yep. <laughs> Couldn't find my mute button. <laughs> I have a motion from Jeff, uh, seconded by Beth, to approve the change order on the extension on this contract. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Kevin, uh, for your work there. Uh, we'll next go to uh, change order uh, EDX 3.0 upgrade with light rail and commuter uh, rail. This is with mo mo modern communication systems. And uh, we'll welcome back Eddie as well as Dave Hancock. Great. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dave Hancock will be presenting uh, this next contract, and we also have Jared Scarborough on uh, online to uh, help us answer any technical questions. So, Dave, you want to run with this one? Yes. Uh, thank you, Eddie, and thank you, Chair and Trustees. Uh, this is a change order to modern communication systems, and it is exercising an option in the existing contract to upgrade our train uh, dispatching software called TDX. Both tracks and front runner will be upgraded to version three of TDX. Right now, tracks is running version one and front runner is running version two. The amount of the change order is for 3,408,261, making the total contract value uh, 4,621,707. Uh, this change order has been budgeted for in the 2021 capital SGR budget. And this upgrade will take approximately one year to complete and includes all new hardware and software for uh, tracks and all new software for Front Runner. Uh, some of the new features of this uh, upgrade of TDX are some new safety features for dispatchers and MOW employees allowing work zones to be automatically applied and the area locked out when work is being performed on the alignment. Integration of the electrical uh, electrification system into the TDX software, allowing dispatchers and MOW to see real-time status of the system, and integration of all substations into the SCADA system, and the ability to perform forms-based functions and data integration for FRA reporting processes. Are there any questions? Dave, I think when we had the pleasure of coming out to one of your staff meetings, you gave a little bit of an update to the system, uh, right, as part of one of the presentations. Yes, we, we did, and, and Jared uh, had that in his presentation with a lot of the data, that uh, technical data for this uh, change order. And we know Jared because he loves spreadsheets and, and, and data. <laughs> was, That's right. It was very, it was very impressive. By the way, um, questions though. Um, I just had one small question. Uh, according to uh, the 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 details, did they change their name to Modern? Is it Modern Railway Systems? Do we have to change the contract as well, or is this just to do uh, the change order part? <laughs> Hey Jared, can you answer that one? They, yeah, the, yeah. I'm not sure the uh, the correct answer to that. Honestly, they the contract we have with them right now for this particular contract, it was uh, when they were under modern communication systems. But you're right; they are changing their name or have changed to just simply Modern Railway Systems for their whole for their whole company. So. Um, I don't know that, I mean, it may be appropriate to have a modification uh, before everything is executed. 
Yeah, this is Todd Mills. I'll go ahead and jump in and, and say, yes, we would do a, a contract modification to the new name. Great, thanks. I just I just caught that and I just wanted to understand how we were doing that moving forward. But thank you. This is great. And I loved the data. The more, the better. So thank you for your presentations in the past as well. Sure, thank you. Other questions? Beth, do you want to make a motion? Uh, with that adjustment. Happy to do that. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the change order for the TDX 3.0 upgrade, the light rail and commuter rail uh, with modern communication systems changing to modern railways Commun systems. Sorry. I will sure. second that motion. I have a, thank you. I have a motion from Beth seconded uh, by Jeff. Um, any uh, other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Todd, uh, looks like you have one uh, pre-procurement update. Yeah, we just have one uh, procurement we're ready to go out for bid for. This is a, a procurement to establish a contract with a firm to provide on-call system maintenance and support for UTA's ongoing state of good repair projects of infrastructure assets. A similar procurement was brought before the board on September 23rd, which was specifically for grade crossing replacements, rail work, uh, rail maintenance, and concrete rehabilitation. This procurement is specifically for systems projects, such as train control modifications and improvements, traffic signal integration, traction power, overhead catenary systems, stray electrical current mitigation, and other rail system support items. This contract will be for a base term of three years plus two one-year options for renewal. Funding for this contract is included in the SDR budget, and this procurement will be conducted as an RFP where technical criteria will be evaluated and scored in addition to price. I have Dave Can Hancock as well to answer any specific questions you might have. Dave, I assume this is different type of contractor than than the one from last September. Is that true, or yeah, could it yeah, be the same group? Yeah, no, these are different types of uh, contractors. The one. Uh, the last few years, we've kind of combined the infrastructure and the systems together and on our on-call contracts. And so we're separating that out because it is two, two different uh, companies and two different types of work. And so uh, that's why we split it out. Okay. Uh, any questions? No? Um, David, I did have a question. When, because um, in the... In the presentation, it talks about the fact that it's um, it includes traffic signal integration. Is that the traffic signals that the grade separation, the grade crossings have, or is that further out? Is that like UDOT uh, traffic signals? I'm just, I'm just that, wondering how that works. That it's it's really both. It's any kind of uh, vehicular traffic in and around the the rail system. This uh, contract would would manage that and and help us with those functions. I, I thank you. I, the reason I asked that is because obviously it makes more sense to integrate the um, the UDOT portion of that as well to have traffic move a little more smoothly. So thank you. Any other questions on this pre-procurement? Well, we wish you good luck in that process and I imagine we'll see you back here in the near term. So thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, we will go to a grant application, um, public transportation COVID research demonstration grant program with e-vouchers uh, with the um, FDA and we'll, our Federal Transit Administration. With that, we'll come back to Mary DeLoretto and, and Ryan Taylor. Mary? Hello, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so on October 5th, of this year, FTA published a notice of funding opportunity for what they're calling the Public Transportation COVID-19 Research Demonstration Grant Program. And the um, purpose of the grant is to improve operational efficiencies of transit systems and enhance mobility for the communities in four major areas. And these four areas are one, a vehicle, facility, equipment, and infrastructure cleaning and disinfection. Two is exposure mitigation measures. Three is innovative mobility, such as contactless payments. 
and four are measures that strengthen public confidence in transit services. So UTA submitted our application in um, early November for the e-voucher, electronic voucher system project. And I have Ryan Taylor here to join me to talk a little bit about what that e-voucher program is. So Ryan, if you are. Sure, thanks Mary. Um, as a little bit of history and background, uh, we have partnered with other human service agencies, um, particularly uh, those serving people with disabilities and seniors to enhance transportation for those individuals. And a lot of these folks can't access the normal UTA system. Um, and some of them are outside of our paratransit, and so they don't have access to, to transportation. And so in our partnerships, particularly with Davis and Weber County Aging Services and Roads to Independence, they issue vouchers uh, for individuals to get a volunteer driver to take them to their um, hospital visits, doctor visits, uh, pharmacies, et cetera. And so um, a while back, we received a grant to build a, an electronic voucher system because right now it's all paper vouchers. Um, and this grant request is to do a phase two of electronic vouchers. And, and the key focuses in phase two would be one, not only to be able to pay a volunteer driver to make those trips, but for those individuals that could access UTA to be able to purchase an electronic fare ticket, a mobile ticket, um, or if you know UTA can't service them, that they could be able to integrate and use a TNC service like Lyft or Uber. And so those are the two primary pieces of development that we would like to include in the next phase of, of the electronic voucher system. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, because there's a need for this, most voucher systems across the country are still paper-based. There's a lot of administrative and uh, potential for waste, fraud, and abuse where this eliminates a lot of that. And so there is a potential to commercialize that and, and uh, push that forward uh, in, in that respect, potentially in producing some income revenue. So that's the grant request. Do you have any questions for us? The only question I have, and I think you just uh, explained it, Ryan, but it sounds like it's a, a nice next step uh, addition to the work that we had commenced with Cambridge Analytics. Is that a fair statement? Correct. That is correct. Okay. All right. Well, it looks hey. like a good opportunity. Beth? Thank you. I had a couple questions. The first one was, um, in any of these types of scenarios, um, I know it can be challenging if you're using Uber or Lyft to um, to transport people with. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of background. I apologize. Um, to transport people with disabilities, how does that address that, or is that uh, part of this whole um, analysis that they're going to continue to use? So that will continue to be a problem, especially with the with the TNCs, with Uber and Lyft. They they do very little investment into um, accessible vehicles to be able to transport people with mobility devices. We're continuing to work on that on other fronts to be able to to increase that option. Um, so this won't directly affect that. It, it, will, it will basically allow those people, say if you have a visual impairment or you have still some mobility, and that could be another option for you. Thank you. And then I had just kind of a follow-up-ish type question. I know that we have um, our pilot right now with VIA does have some ability to access for dis for disabled individuals. And I just wondered if that would be some at some point incorporated. I know we're still in a pilot phase, so I know that that's kind of premature, but I'm just curious if that was kind of calculated in these some of these discussions moving forward. Yeah, so when we're talking about integration for UTA, I think we would like to include microtransit in that as well. Um, and, and so if we're awarded this grant, we'll definitely include that into the scope of work. Thank you. Any other questions on this grant application? Mary, when do we anticipate hearing back on it? Is it? Well, the, the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity does not say when the grant okay. will be awarded. We're hoping before the end of the year. It does require, though, that the once if we get awarded the grant, that we complete the project within two years. So. Okay, great. Um, 
I don't think at this point you're just letting us know we're not uh, proving anything, correct? Correct. It's just for yeah. information. It was an okay. interesting project we wanted to tell you about. No, it's great. And, and uh, Ryan, I know you've really let out on this and, and uh, we find a good uh, solid resolution. It will be beneficial to a lot of entities around the country. So thank you for your work awesome. here. Thank you. Um, we're going to, uh, we have some service fair agreements. There are a lot of similarities to them. So I'm hoping we can kind of push through them and then we'll take a short break after that. Um, but we welcome back Monica Morton and, and it looks like there's apparently other resorts are going to still open for ski service. Hello again. Yes. So I do have several agreements. I think we can get through them pretty quickly. I'll start with an overview of the contracts and then go through each one individually. On November 11th, I requested approval for contracts with the Cottonwood Resorts, but today I am requesting approval for the remaining resorts. That includes Powder Mountain, Snow Basin, and Sundance. And we also have contracts with David County, Davis County, Morgan County, and Visit Salt Lake. UTA has had a long relationship with many partners to promote and grow ski bus ridership during the winter months. And this year we're teaming up with um, our partners again, although circumstances are slightly different because of COVID and through negotiations, as I mentioned before, we have been sensitive to the needs of our partners in establishing the terms and the pricing. Pricing will remain the same as last year on these contracts, and it is based on a fixed amount. The contract term is one year, and if limited service is warranted or if service is suspended because of COVID, the base purchase price of the contract will be adjusted accordingly. The Powder Mountain contract revenue is estimated to be 57,500. With your approval, we will move forward and execute this contract. Do you have any questions? Any questions on that one? I don't see any, Monica. Do you want us to, to, would you like us to take motions as you go along or wait till the end? I can get through all of them, whatever works for you. Um, well, let's take one on each of these as we go through them. So uh, I would entertain a motion on this agreement. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the fair agreement with Ski Bus um, SMHG Management and Powder Mountain. I second that motion. Motion by Beth, seconded by Jeff uh, to approve the contract. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. All right. Monica, next one. The Snow Basin contract revenue is estimated to be $46,000, $46,300. With your approval, we will move forward and execute this contract. Motion to approve the fare agreement, uh, ski bus agreement with uh, Snow Basin. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. All right, we'll go to the next one. The Sundance, the Sundance Mountain Resort contract revenue is estimated to be $7,300, and I request approval for that contract. Mr. Chair, I make a motion that we approve the fair agreement uh, for ski bus with Sundance. I'll second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, to approve the agreement with Sundance. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, next one. The Davis County contract revenue is estimated to be $82,025. With your approval, we'll execute that contract. Make a motion is to approve the ski bus agreement with Davis County. Second. I have a motion uh, by Jeff, seconded by Beth. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that passes. Uh, the next one is a fair agreement with Morgan County. Thank you. That revenue is estimated to be $6,881, and I'd like approval for that contract. One question I had here, is that because there's a one, the one stop in Morgan as you go on to Snow Basin? Is that the purpose of this agreement? I will let Andreas confirm he is on the call as well. Good morning. Um, yes, that is exactly uh, the reason for the Morgan County contract is uh, to cover the percentage of costs um, for that one bus stop in Mount Marine. Okay. okay, that makes sense. 
and it's nice to have their participation as well. So, and, uh, any other questions, though? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the fare agreement for ski bus uh, with Morgan County. I'll second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by um, Jeff. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. That brings us down to the city super pass agreement with Visit Salt Lake. Yes, thank you. So this is the last contract to visit Salt Lake. It will be invoiced monthly and billed at $5 per EFC trip with a 20% discount. We estimate the contract value to be somewhere between 15,000 and 17,000. So with your approval, we will move forward and execute this contract as well. A motion to approve the fair agreement between uh, the Ski City Super Pass Agreement with Visit Salt Lake. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth for approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Let's see, Monica, it uh, looks like you're off the hook at this mm -hmm. point, so. Thanks. I, I realize it wasn't that simple to get to this point, so thanks uh, to you and your staff, as well as our general managers for getting these agreements done, so thank you. Well, with that, we're going to take a, a, a slightly short, shorter than 10 minute break. We'll plan to come back about 1035 and uh, have the remaining uh, discussion items. So, thank you.
We welcome you back from our break and um, we'll now move into our discussion items. Uh, and the first one up is a UTA Fall 2020 COVID-19 Writer Survey Report. And um, with that, we would welcome um, uh, Nicole Bordeaux and, as well as uh, Megan uh, Waters back. Uh, Nicole, do you want to take this? Thank you, trustee, and hello, trustees. We're here today to talk about the uh, a survey that we conducted back in October, if you remember. We uh, conducted a general survey and an eco pass survey back in May. Um, that survey was to really uh, find out what the writer's experience was during our COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today, we are uh, doing that uh, presentation again today to give you a summary of October uh, survey that we did. And um, this time we combined those uh, uh, surveys for the EcoPass and the general survey. And also uh, we included our uh, educational pass partners. So they were writing during this time as well. Um, so what you're gonna hear today is a little bit about um, our demographics. So you'll hear a little breakdown of who's writing, their backgrounds and demographics. You'll also why they're writing at this time, um, kind of their trip patterns, as well as um, a, a discussion of what we can do better, how we're doing, um, and then we can use that information to further understand during uh, the situation of COVID and then moving out. And, and so we can use that information throughout uh, UTA. In addition, um, the team, and, and Megan's going to speak a little bit about this uh, going forward and, and the re reports that'll come out of this. We did focus groups this time to dive in a little bit more on the detail so that we could have a uh, qualitative analysis of uh, uh, getting more information. So I'm going to turn the time over to Megan and we can uh, dive into some of those summaries. So uh, if we could get the next slide, please. Or, thank you. Thanks, Nicole. So this um, this background sort of reiterates what Nicole was saying. I just want to add um, this population on this October survey is a different population from our spring survey. Um, it's distinct from our other surveys, the onboard survey, the benchmark survey, and so they're not strictly comparable. So just keep that in mind as we're as we're going through some of the findings um, to promote the survey and, and get folks to participate. We used a multiple multiple methods of outreach. So we heavily promoted on social media. We also used some of our existing email listservs through Gov Delivery, which is our service alerts program. People can opt in to receive communications from UTA through that. We also sent out to registered fair pay card holders. Um, we also shared with external partners through um, civil rights department, travel training, planning, as well as business development, who was instrumental in getting the word out to pass EcoPass and EdPass partners. And you'll see that they were very well represented in this survey. Next slide, please. So we asked about the demographics of the participants, really just to understand how we compare with um, some of our some of our general ridership information from the onboard survey. So the next few slides are going to cover the demographics we collected on this survey and comparing them to our 2019 onboard survey results. Next slide. So here we have our zip code density map from this October rider survey. You can see the yellow represents a high density of responses. So there was a good concentration of responses from the Orem Provo area. And I think that's mostly attributable to our EdPass partners being very involved in, in responding to the survey from BYU and UVU. Um, we also saw high response rates from the surrounding populous areas in um, Utah County and Salt Lake County. Next slide. So first a look at income levels. The rider survey from October is represented by the blue bars, while the 2019 onboard survey is represented by the gray bars. We see that there is a high representation of individuals making less than $18,000 on the rider survey at 27% and also a high representation of those individuals making more than $100,000 per year. So I think that those, those two factors are really explained by the high participation of ECO and EdPass partners. Next slide. 
We also asked about age. The, again, the rider survey is represented in the blue bars here, and the onboard survey from 2019 is represented in the gray bars. We did have, we had a pretty similar trend in terms of age groups that are responding and writing the system. Next slide. On the race ethnicity uh, demographic factor, we did have a higher representation of those identifying as white um, at 85% compared to general ridership information from the onboard survey, which is 76%. So this can kind of tell us which populations are being overrepresented or underrepresented in our um, survey participation. Next slide. We also asked about fair payment method. And can, can, can I ask a oh, question yeah. on the prior slide? Sorry. Sure. And I don't know if we can go back to the prior slide. Do we? And I don't know if Nicole knows this answer or or you. Do we? We do we track ethnicity of as far as our users? I imagine we have to use them in our Title VI analysis. We and do. I, yeah. It, it would it would seem like the white race show here is much higher than say our general population. Um, as far as ratio of, um, and, so, and so it almost looks like we're a little undersampled. Is that a fair, for, for other ethnicities, is that fair to say, or is that, do you think these are in line with uh, our normal users? So the onboard survey is how we track our race for our users, and, and that's every four to five years we do that, and so that's what we base our Title VI and all our information on. And so when we do these surveys, that's kind of what we're trying to base it on so that we have a, a fair representation. So that's basically our breakdown and how we use our, our race breakdown. It's not um, representation of uh, Utah or uh, Salt Lake County or Utah County, but that's who uh, what we represent to FTA as UTA's users. And so, so, we'll so oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Nicole. Um, so that is what we are looking at when we look at um, uh, our, our surveys to say, okay, if we're going out for a representation, are we oversampling or undersampling those breakdowns? So when we went out to the survey, we're saying, okay, we had 85% versus 76% of white, and we over, you know, we had a 13% of our writers on our onboard survey were uh, were Latino or Hispanic, and in this survey, we only had seven. Does that answer your question? So. Um, yeah, let me let me just say that the onboard survey, Carlton, is ba there is a sampling. We do a sampling and making sure everything is appropriately done. So statistically, it's a good representation of our ridership. The rider survey is just sent out, and it's not, um, you know, based on random um, sample size. It's just sort of we want we're just sort of tracking what's going on right now during the pandemic. Okay. And that's what we're doing. So the reason why when we talk about the onboard survey, that is sort of what we use as our where we see our riders and levels when we because that's based on a statistical sampling. That maybe are currently riding with us. Right. And and so the onboard survey is much more of a statistical sample. The rider survey is more voluntary as to whether they s fill out the survey or not. Okay. That that is helpful. Thank you for uh stopping to clarify that. Um, one quick question that just kind of triggered in my head. Is there an option to not disclose the race or ethnicity if you are doing this survey? On both, yes. Yes. There. Okay. That, that's true even on the onboard survey. Thanks, Megan. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for the questions and the clarifications. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So on fair payment, we we have a little bit, um, so you can see the gray bars again are representing the onboard survey from 2019 and the blue bars are this rider survey. Um, the the um, There's not a direct comparison here because we broke out the categories a little bit differently for this rider survey. So you can see overall from the onboard survey, uh, there were 38% using an electronic card. And then we saw on this survey, 39% um, using an electronic card affiliated with a university, and then 20% also using, a, using an electronic card from an employer. So we had a really high representation of individuals that use EFC um, through an EdPass or an EcoPass program. 
Other than that, I think um, there's there's similar trends across different fair modes. We had 20% um, of the participants on this survey uh, reported using a fair pay card to pay fair. And um, you can, I won't go through every statistic. Um, any questions on that? Okay, we can go to the next slide. Finally, asking about access to alternative transportation. On the left is the rider survey results. On the right is the onboard survey. So you can see in the gray here now represented is um, folks who do have access to alternative transportation. So in the blue, we see 26% total on the rider survey do not have access to alternative modes of transportation. This compares to our onboard survey really differently. So our onboard survey in general, 53% report that they do not have access to alternative modes of transportation. So we do have a higher um, representation of people with access to cars or um, friends with, with cars, family members, that they can get other rides um, than public transit. Next slide. So diving into the results a little bit, we'll go to the next slide. We received over 2,000 responses from 115 unique zip codes. We found that two-thirds have ridden during COVID-19. Again, 74% said that they have access to alternative modes of transportation. And again, about 58% use an electronic fare card from a university or an employer who responded to this survey. In terms of riding frequency, we looked both at current riders, we were able to break it out, and those who said they're not currently riding. So among our current riders, 64% of them ride at least one time per week, and 45% ride at least three times per week. Among those not currently riding, 62% rode at least one time per week prior to COVID, and about half rode at least three times per week. Next slide. We also asked about what modes people were taking. We saw 57% report that they ride bus, 40% indicated tracks, 49% said they rode front runner, and there were smaller percentages for other UTA modes, um, and people were able to select more than one mode. Next slide. So this is a question we repeated from the spring survey. We wanted to know how, how people were aware of the safety measures UTA was implementing. 76% of these survey participants said that they are aware of safety measures that we have taken during COVID-19. We asked them to rate us on several different measures here on a scale of one to seven, one being very poor, seven being excellent. So that would put four at neutral. And you can see scores here range from 4.7 to 4.9, which are all above neutral, which is great. Um, we asked about communication, our cleaning of vehicles, provision of service, as well as safety, and they all scored positively. Next slide. We wanted to understand from those who are not currently riding some of their main reasons for not riding the system right now. 55% said that they work from school or home, and that was their reason for not riding transit. 48% are driving personal vehicles, and 42% expressed concern for health and safety. Next slide. This is another question we uh, used to compare to the spring survey. Um, you can see across the top, this was usage of public transit like their trip purposes during COVID-19 in the spring. So school, work, healthcare, errands, and, and visits, um, social visits. And we, we can see across the bottom the fall responses. So almost every category except healthcare increased as, trip, as a trip usage with school being back in session and work going back to in-office locations. Those, are, um, those make sense that those increased. Next slide, thank you. Um, we also asked about rider outlook. So we wanted to know what were, what were people's situations for school or working. 28% said that they work from school or home currently, um, while 40% work or, or are schooling on site. 23% had a mixture of home and on site school or work. We also asked about when riders thought that their schedules would return to normal or semi normal. 35% indicated it would be later than January 1st. 
33% uh, did not know, and then 23% indicated that they had already returned to a normal or semi-normal schedule. We also asked when riders' schedules returned to normal, would they return to transit? 49% indicated they were somewhat likely to very likely to return, and 41% indicated they were somewhat unlikely to very unlikely to return. Next slide. We also asked about um, factors that would increase likelihood of continuing to ride or riding again in the future. So you can see our current riders. The top four answers for current riders include cleaning and disinfecting practices, passenger loads and social distancing, increased service levels, as well as reduced fares. The top four priorities look a little bit different for those who are not currently riding. We saw passenger loads and social distancing being the first priority, cleaning and disinfecting, a requirement to work on site at a work location, and then increased service levels. Next slide. We wanted to look a little bit at the um, ridership outlook by mode. And just a note, so I put the bus tracks and front runner modes across the top here of this chart. Um, modes are not mutually exclusive, so there's going to be a little bit of overlap in the counts on each of these since people were able to say they ride multiple modes. Um, we looked at the schedules returning. So across, across the different modes, there's not a ton of difference on schedules returning to normal. Um, it, it very much follows how the overall results turned out. You can see across the top also, um, there's a lower percentage of people who say they ride bus who are not currently riding. So only a quarter of those who take bus aren't riding. That means three quarters are still riding. Um, that looks a little bit different on the tracks and front runner modes. Looking at environment, which is the- Megan, the, I apologize. No, you're One good. quick question. Um, when we talk about bus, does that um, by default or some other type of scenario include UVX? I th that's that's really user dependent, I think, because we did have some, not a lot, respond as an other mode. They would say UVX, but that was not the majority, I think. So some people are categorizing UVX as bus. Um, ac across the environment row here, um, again, it's it's fairly similar to the overall results. However, we see a lower percentage of those who are who are bus users working from school or home compared to tracks and front runner. At twenty three percent of bus users working from school or home compared to thirty one percent and twenty nine percent respectively on tracks and front runner. Um, Again, on the flip side of that, there's more bus users who are working out of the home at 44%. And then on that final row, um, likelihood of returning to transit did look somewhat different across the different modes. So we can see on the bus column here, 61% of those who said they use bus indicated they were somewhat to very likely to return to transit, while 30% indicated they were somewhat to very unlikely to return. For tracks, those numbers were 49% likely, 40% somewhat to very unlikely. And then 52% who, who say they took front runner were, said that they were somewhat to very likely to return, while 39% said they, they were somewhat to very unlikely to return. So there are some differences on those modes. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just briefly, um, I'll have more information to share in terms of the findings from the discussion groups, but I just wanted to share that we did implement seven discussion groups with to total of 40 participants. Um, the first set of discussion groups was held with, with people who participated in the spring survey. So we had collected contact information from those survey participants just as an opt-in, and they were contacted again to see if they wanted to participate in a discussion group to sort of dive a little bit deeper into some of the, the questions we're asking. The second set of discussion groups was held with students and university or college affiliated individuals. So we asked the discussion groups very similar questions across all, all seven groups. We asked about their writing habits, their concerns regarding safety and COVID-19 on the system, as well as our response to the pandemic and also ridership outlook. And I'll have more, as I said, more to share in the comprehensive reports. Um, next slide. 
So to wrap up some of our key findings from this survey and the preliminary results, um, the EdPass partners were included in this survey. They were not included in the spring survey, so it was important for us to include them in this October survey. And um, they, they showed up for us. Almost 40% of the participants said that they use a university or college transit pass. So we were successful in, in getting representation from those EdPass users. UTA rated positively related to cleaning and disinfecting, safety, service, and communication in response to COVID. We also saw that social distancing, cleaning and disinfecting, as well as service levels remain key factors for both those who are currently riding the system as well as those not currently riding in terms of maintaining and gaining ridership in the future. And finally, there's still uncertainty about when people will return to work or school or normal schedules. Next slide. And our next steps, as I mentioned, um, we did have over 2,000 responses and some of the questions on the survey were open-ended and so we have some qualitative analysis to finish up um, for the comprehensive reports that we will share very soon. Um, we hope to share those first internally and then externally with the public and follow up with the community, especially those who took the survey to share the results back with them. And we are also um, very much looking forward to continuing to check in with riders and the community as we move forward and evolve um, during COVID-19. And I think that concludes my presentation. I am happy to take any questions. Well, a couple of thoughts I, I had in, in looking at some of those numbers. Um, first of all, uh, we may wanna, as we compile through some of that data, collaborate a little bit with Wasatch Front Regional Council. They've been having some discussions on demand management and, and trying to sort of figure out that big question. It was interesting also to see how many were sort of not sure what their employer was going to do back in October. Uh, if, if that level of question existed then, I got to imagine it got extended <laughs> a few months um, with our most recent numbers. Um, there's probably even uh, less certainty about it. I also thought to myself, and especially in you looked at the front runner numbers, you know, they, they're sort of desire not to return back to transit as much, um, that propensity, they're also they're probably in their minds assuming that the free, freeways would be like they currently are. And, and I think as employers bring people back and the congestion hits the freeways, that mindset could change a little bit. It, it won't be instantaneous. And, I, you know, I do think there will be a, 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 a lag, but, um, you know, when true commuting returns, I think we've kind of become oblivious to what, uh, you know, stop traffic looked like back in February. But um, anyway, but it was, that's helpful. Those are, those are really good points. I think just, it's hard to, for people to predict what will happen in the future too. So that can contribute, I think, to some of the uncertainty. Yeah, so you, of course. In Utah County, you both, uh, UVU and BYU, uh, they're not returning back to school, uh, so you're going to have pretty dramatic, I would assume, downturn. Uh, I could be wrong with UVX uh, for the next month and a half or whatever it might be. Good point. Um, Beth, did you have any questions on that? No? Um, not any real questions. I do appreciate getting all of this data. I think that it is incredibly valuable for us to understand the motivations of people. And I think I think it really is reflective just of uncertainty in general. Um, people just don't know how things are going, not only for them personally, but collectively. And so I think um, I think this continuation of doing these types of surveys and getting this data is going to be really valuable when we actually have you know, the situation of some type of a vaccine or something else that can really change people's confidence levels. Because I, I feel like those are reflective in what their personal choices are as well. So I, you know, great job. And I, I do think that if we can really take a look at this, not just as a collective, um, you know, like say for Outrunner, for instance, or whatever, 
but also like, you know, in a regional sense too, to kind of understand more of those nuances. I think that that would be valuable too. So I, 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 great job. Thank you. And trustees, just um, to let you know, Andrea's team is doing our general benchmark survey that's out there and is st uh, statistically valid. So we'll have that information as a baseline as well as the onboard that we can take this all, um, as well. So it'll have focus groups as well as it's out in the public too. So you'll get that presentation coming forward probably in the spring, uh, late spring, summer. So that'll also give you some additional information, a little more broader to the general public, but it will have some COVID questions on there as well. So I think that just keeps that conversation uh, as you're talking about Trustee Holbrook in a regional sense. And we'll have that statistical validation that um, Carolyn was speaking about. So I think that's good. Thank you. You know, as you keep analyzing the data, it's uh, there may be some trigger points that uh, through marketing we can utilize that in a way that uh, will incent or encourage people to get back on the transit uh, systems that we have. And and that may be evident, you know, uh, data is always open for, uh, you know, to analyze and determine cause and effect. And, uh, you know, I trust that all of you will do a great job and maybe, maybe making recommendations and charting a course forward that will help uh, encourage people to get back on transit, so. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Trustee um, Easterson. It, I think these ridership surveys were part of the ta task force discussion, and one of the plans that we had done was to get some information. We were lucky we completed an onboard sur survey, a large one, on in October 2019, so we were able to see what our riders were like then and then start to sort of judge not judge, but actually gain some information about sort of where our writers are now, what's going on. But a lot of this information is supposed to help us sort of figure out what do we need to do to have people feel comfortable about taking transit again, and also um, you know, looking at sort of what the forces are that are keeping them away. And, and we don't know. And the one thing that isn't in here is just other, you know, once people maybe return back to work, does the traffic go back up? And that's something they don't really have to judge. I mean, there is still traffic. I will say that if you drive up, particularly in going between Utah County and Salt Lake County. But um, if you take a look at that, if that starts to come back, does that start to drive our ridership differently? Yeah. Those are things that we'll continue to look at. Yeah. Great. All right. uh, any other questions? Not seeing any. Uh, Nicole and, and Megan, thanks for that update and for that report. And we'll look forward to some uh, other information in the days to come. So thank you. Um, with that, we'll go to our low income fair pilot program uh, part two. Sounds like a movie sequel, Monica. Uh, <laughs> <you want? laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us is. who's playing and who stars in this one. Absolutely. Um, as you'll recall, in January, uh, part one of the low income pilot was approved. We're referring to part one as the program we have in place right now through June 30th. And that's a pilot that offers discounts to qualifying human service agencies. And it's been successful. You heard that during the November 11th board presentation. We gave an update there. And part two will actually offer discount on fares purchased by individuals that qualify based on income levels. So you're looking at a slide here, um, and I want to share with you our current discounts. UTA has a reduced fare program, and that's required by the FTA providing seniors, people with disabilities, and Medicare card holders half fare on fixed route during off-peak hours. We actually extend this. We go beyond this requirement, and we also offer half fares um, during peak hours. And in addition, the youth were added to this program as of yesterday, so they get half fares. We also have a 50% discount, discount for Horizon cardholders. That's our Horizon Pass program. And these are customers that have been issued a Horizon card through the Medicaid program. And UTA had a homeless program. We've phased that out. That's what's being replaced with with what we're calling part one for the human service organizations. That's a 75% discount. It's actually free to the end user and that fare is purchased by our human service organizations. Next slide, please. 
So before I discuss details of the pilot, I do just want to emphasize that this is actually part of a bigger initiative to improve our reduced fare programs. And we formed an internal working group. There are several initiatives we are tracking that will improve the status quo. And everyone is working hard and committed to making this pilot and our other initiatives successful. So I just want to give them a shout out and express my appreciation for their feedback, ideas, and expertise, but some of the areas for improvement in our reduced fare program were looking to develop an accessible online application to also create a, a database that houses this information. We're looking to move to a single reduced fare card. We have a couple different cards out there right now, and then same with our paper passes. We would like to combine those. We have a lot of different paper passes that um, we're tracking and distributing for these discounts. Next slide, please. Our vision with part two of the low income program is to expand the Horizon Pass program like we did the homeless program. The Horizon Pass program will be eliminated if this pilot program becomes permanent because it will actually become a component of this expanded program. And this will actually give more people access to a discount, which is what we're trying to achieve. Next slide, please. The objectives of the pilot provide in include providing immediate assistance to low wage workers and supporting economic recovery during COVID-19, increase the use of electronic fair media, increase ridership and align with fair strategy. Next slide, please. There are several customer groups that benefit from having a discount available. I just spoke of our reduced fare programs and that assists seniors, people with disabilities, Medicare card holders and youth. The low income pilot part one serves customer groups such as the homeless, refugees, parolees, those recovering from addiction, mental illness, and even those that are seeking employment that are working with the human service agency. However, as the last column um, in this slide indicates, there is still a gap of customers and they do not have access to a discount. These include low wage workers and also those seeking employment that may not be working with a human service agency. Next slide, please. A common measure used to determine who qualifies for certain benefits and programs is the federal poverty level. So this is the chart showing the different levels and to be eligible for discounts on transit. We would also define income levels and set eligibility criteria. And I recommend for the pilot, uh, we base it on 150% of the federal poverty level. So looking at this table for a family of four, this is 39,300 a year. Next slide, please. We've been talking about the onboard survey data. We went back to it and looked at the numbers using a threshold of 150%. We've identified that 40, 47% of our customers are below this threshold and 53% are above. And note that there were a group of customers in the survey that chose not to disclose uh, their income, and we did categorize those customers as below the federal poverty line. Next slide, please. Distilling this information down a little bit more, 50% of those below the federal poverty line paid full fare. 41% had their fare subsidized through a program and 9% had a discount option available. So this illustrates my point earlier that a large group of our riders do not have access to a discount because they're paying full fare. Next slide, please. And the final, final data point I wanna share about our customers paying full fare, 82% of them are employed and 15% are seeking employment. So this pilot will definitely give us an opportunity to provide immediate assistance to low wage workers, especially as we try to support economic recovery during COVID-19. Next slide. There are multiple elements that I'll share with you in a, a few different slides, but they include fair media, uh, the discount we give them, what fair products this is available on, how we qualify them, how they apply, how we administer it, how we distribute passes, and in what ways they become eligible. So I'll review those with you in detail now. Next slide. Going from left to right in this table that you can see the first element, Fair Media, our current Horizon Pass program is paper, but this pilot will focus on using the Fair Pay card with the option in the future of using a mobile device. 
And next element is discount. The fair pay card has a discount of 20%, but this pilot will not stack discounts. It'll be a 50% discount, and that matches the new Horizon Pass program discount that just went into effect yesterday. Prior to that, it was a 25% discount. Next slide. The fair product will be a one-way trip, which is what the fair pay card uses, and currently uh, the Horizon card is a regular monthly pass. In the future, we could consider mirroring all of the same fair products uh, that we offer for the reduced fair program, but not for this pilot. The next um, key element for customers to qualify for this pilot, they would need to be receiving other types of aid or have an income level that is 150% below the federal poverty line. Next slide. The last three considerations then are the application, the administration, and the distribution. And the application process is currently not required on the Horizon card because customers qualify through a third party partner. For this pilot, we recommend having customers go online and complete an online application through UTA. And we will determine if the customer uh, qualifies to participate. Our preference in the future is to have all qualifications done through a third party, but this will actually take more time to put into place. We'll administer the program, we'll distribute the cards, and take care of those two elements. Our projected timeline is to roll the pilot out Q1 of this coming year in 2021, and that is dependent upon getting the online application built. We're working with IT on that exact timeline right now, but we would like to run the pilot for six months. We do feel within the next um, ranging from two to three months, we can have it up and running. So with that said, this concludes my presentation. I'd like to hear your feedback and also give you any answers to questions that you might have. A couple of questions for you, Monica. Um, uh, when you say a six month window, so would it be six months from January or six months from when you are able to actually start taking or giving out passes? Yes, it would be uh, six months from launch date. And so launch, launch date, we would expect, yes. The other, well, for, uh, first of all, I like it a lot. Um, we, we've had a lot of discussions, you know, on a multi-agency basis on access to opportunities and people, you know, trying to get the employment that, you know, helps improve themselves and transportation is such a big factor in that, that I think, especially when you look at the amount of public funding that comes into our system, um, it also uh, addresses, we had some comments during the budget hearings and things about having a $1 fare, and I, I actually, if I'm giving a discount away to somebody, I, I'd rather have it be this population base, um, uh, you know, as opposed to somebody who's, you know, necessarily getting something through a you know, employer based or or maybe has a, a larger salary to accommodate that fare. But so I, I like the general direction. I, I, I worry uh, for the sake of you and your staff on the administration. One of the questions I had is, is uh, it, it's easy to calculate 150%, but do you, what would you use as proof that sort of they were in that income category? I mean, would they have to submit a tax return or or, or how, how would you sort of validate that they've are actually in that income level? Yeah, good question. There are what we're seeing other agencies do is we're looking at tax return, W-2, last two pay stubs. We would identify probably one of those three pieces of documentation that they would upload with their application and we would look at those to determine how much they're making and then it would be either they qualify or they don't. Okay. And, and would it be your staff that would uh, review those? Or are you using customer service or? It would be a combination of the two. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Um, we, we do expect my staff to, to provide the actual um, yes or no decision, but we would receive help from Cindy and her team in administering this. Okay. Uh, other and questions? I think... Oh, just, just speaking a little bit to administration, because I know that they're, um, your concerns are our concerns, obviously. And 
Having it done through a third party partner would be um, extremely simple, but a couple of ways that we can do it, we can keep this contained to a smaller pilot. And um, if we feel like it's starting to get too much to administer, we can kind of monitor processes as we go along, but we're not, until we actually get the pilot out there, it's really hard to gauge what the administrative, administrative effort will take and how many people will be utilizing the program. Yes, it looks like you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks, Monica. We um, we really do appreciate all of the um, all of the information that you're trying to to gain from all of this. And and I I completely agree with Carlton. I think that if we are giving discounts, these are this is definitely the direction we want to be going and making sure that we're getting the people who really need to have that transportation access that available to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. One a couple of questions that I had. Um, if if we're going to be doing the um, the analysis, um, is there how are we getting access to these to this slightly broader perspective of people? How are we going to get that and and communicate that type of information? And then um, if if we're going to be um, doing this, is there a way to uh, to increase that connectivity in reverse once we're through with this um, with this pilot, could we, for instance, um, we've identified X number of people that really could benefit from this type of program. Can we get that information in a in a way that's constructive to other service providers or or some other component? That was just my two questions on that as to what we can do. Or, or I had questions that I had on this. So, but thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so the first question that you had about being able to connect and how are we connecting with these individuals? Um, we would take the same approach that we we did with the human service pilot, and that is we included uh, Nicole, Andrea, their staff, Megan helped us, and so we sat down. We looked at um, different areas, groups. So I think we would have to work with their expertise in how to connect with these individuals, and obviously open to any ideas or feedbacks of ways that we could do that, but. Um, using the information and the data in the reverse, I feel like because of our human service pilot, we have a good relationship now with these providers, which is a great first step to getting them to partner with them. And so um, being able to continually stay in touch with them, um, have additional focus groups with them and or meetings, I think that we could definitely benefit from the information we both have on these individuals and use it to our both of our advantages going forward. Yeah, thanks. It makes a lot of sense for us to be able to to to, to utilize this information in, in a constructive way. I recognize there are privacy issues, et cetera, but really, this if if we can help to benefit um, a low income population, I just think that that's going to benefit everybody. So, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's it seems like a I don't know. It seems like it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> I, I just uh, I applaud your efforts and your focus. Uh, you know, I would I would opt to do something very simple and just offer free ridership for a month to everybody, and then get to collect the data from everyone that you know to see if we increase our ridership, and then collect the data and see if the low income people are the ones that are actually riding it. I would assume most people that would take uh, advantage of a free fare would be those that are probably in those lower incomes. I can't imagine most people that uh, are at a higher salary would would opt to, to go on, you know, as frequently, maybe they do it once or twice, but I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking out of the box here and I'll, I'll give it some more thought, but I'd like to see us somehow increase our ridership and, and not have to wait months and months and months uh, to just see, get people more accustomed to using transit again. But this is a good step. I think it's wonderful and addresses those that are in those low incomes that really don't have the money to do it. So thank you for your efforts. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for that feedback. I definitely think that um, one thing we have going for us with this pilot is that we will be getting electronic data coming in. So in the instance that we do offer free fares, just side comments, sometimes it is difficult to understand who actually rode and who took advantage of it, but I'd, I'd love to keep that up for consideration and I'll think about that more and take it back to our team. So thank you for that feedback, but it is a lot to administer. 
but the I think the key thing here is that we have not done it for years and years because of that. And we're hoping online with this new application will simplify some of that, but I'm up for the challenge and uh, we're going to do the best that we can to make this successful. Any other feedback or comments? The, if not, the only other thought I okay. had, uh, Monica, is, is um, you know, maybe through Nicole and Megan's efforts, um, we could also connect with the school districts uh, who administer the free lunch program. Um, I think we, you know, that's a, a process where they're already having to go through qualifications, not necessarily to administer the PASS program, but in notification of potential users, uh, you know, I think there's probably some opportunities there that the districts could be helpful for, and I think in turn would be helpful to the districts if those parents' mobility um, improves. So it's a thought, but... Um, well, I, I I don't uh, sense any opposition to at least trying it for the six months after your launch date. Um, is, Beth, do you have any concerns about them going forward? No, thank you. I I feel like this would really be beneficial for us um, to to understand this in more depth anyway. And so by having this data. Um, I just think it's going to be really valuable. Even if we end up in different structures moving forward, we'll have a really good solid basis as to why we chose to do something else or or why we chose to stay in this in this pathway. So, no, I think yeah. that I have no hesitation. I think this is great. And, and how about you, Jeff? Well, I just uh, I just want to applaud your effort and and please, if you find yourself sinking, uh, don't be afraid to. Uh, shout out to us to see how we can maybe help lift the load a little bit for you so thank you thank you for well, your support well good well keep us posted monica and how that progresses and and thanks for giving that a shot so um it looks like you're uh, can't get away quite yet because you <laughs> have a fair capping pilot program you also want to try should we go I to do. that one I do have another pilot here to share with you. Okay, so um, do we have that presentation pulled up? There we go. Okay. Um, when we adopted the FAIR policy last month, it included guiding principles that would allow our FAIR system to be simple, easy, convenient, and equitable, to name a few. And one way that this can be accomplished is by taking advantage um, of our technology, specifically enhancing UTA's electronic fare collection capabilities. So we've partnered with IT to develop technology that will automatically put a cap on the amount of fare our customer pays. During my presentation, I'll go over how it works. I'll share a few benefits, the purpose of the pilot, and review um, the key elements necessary to launch. In this slide that you're seeing here, um, this is our fare pay card and some details about it. Our customers have that option today to use this card, it's reloadable, they prepay, um, they determine how much they want to put to it, and then every time they tap it, um, their balance goes down, they get a green light when they tap on the reader, and currently we have a 20% discount if they use that card. And the electronic fare collection system in the back end, it'll calculate the fare, it'll reduce the card balance, and it'll automatically apply transfer credits. Next slide, please. This data, again, our onboard survey shows, if you look at 40, the 47% of our customers that I shared earlier that are 150% below the federal poverty line, um, though 16% of those riders, those customers are using our, our fair pay card now. And those that are 57% above the poverty line, 18% of those are using the fair pay card now. So we do have people that are currently using it and it's between 16 to 18%. Next slide. Throughout the presentation, I will highlight some of the key elements of the pilot and the decisions that we need to make. So for example, we need to determine the cap amounts before we move forward with the pilot. But first, let me share with you how fair capping works. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, this only works on the fair pay card. It would replace the current 20% discount. We would not stack discounts. Um, a day cap would be implemented for regular service trips. 
So the day cap, once a customer takes two trips in a day, they've earned the equivalent of a day pass at $5 and no additional um, charges are deducted from their balance. And a weekly cap would be implemented for regular and premium service trips. So once a customer rides for four days in the week, the remaining three days will be free. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, that's a decision we'll need to solidify, but I'm, I'm using that as an example throughout this presentation. Next slide. Fair capping has a lot of benefits. Um, in addition to rewarding our frequent riders, it also eliminates the upfront cash burden required for a monthly pass, and sometimes that limits our riders. Um, implement, it implements a pay-as-you-go infrastructure, and our customers can load as often as they would like, even if that's on a daily basis. Another benefit is there's no need to figure out the fair products that give the best possible fare. Do I buy a daily pass? Do I buy a monthly pass? There's, there's no need to guess the number of trips that you'll make in a month to see if you'll benefit from a discount for a monthly pass. All of this is done automatically. Next slide. It will be necessary to test the functionality before we decide to implement it on a permanent basis, and we will do this with a controlled group of customers. We also need to confirm that data we're getting back from the pilot is accurate and that charges are correct. Now we've done this and this will be part of the testing that we're doing prior to releasing this software, but we, we definitely want to monitor live trip data as we receive it in. And our goal is also to collect feedback from users and then monitor the level of free trips and days that are being used. So as the data comes in, we'll be able to see um, how many uh, customers were able to take advantage of either the three free days or additional trips in a given day. Next slide. So what, what we're envisioning is selecting participants again for a six month period. Uh, we would ask for volunteers from our existing registered fair pay customer list. It's an opt-in list. Um, users have asked or agreed to get communications from us. Uh, we would also partner with business and organizations that work with uh, shift workers or transit dependent um, customers. So I think that we can, um, like we were talking about earlier, reach out to different organizations and get assistance with them on getting a small controlled group together. But these will be certain individuals that either have a fair pay card already that we can program with a new technology or that we would distribute a new fair pay card. So on the back end, uh, we would shift over the way fares are calculated. It, it's extremely seamless, but short in, in short, that's how it work. Next slide, please. So our next steps um, after this discussion would be to receive approval. Our timeline would be to launch the pilot towards the end of January and the beginning of February. Uh, that's the latest that we see being able to launch this and we would do it for a period of six months. We obtain feedback, monitor the results. And then at that time we get together, have another discussion with you, have essentially kind of a go, no go session and determine if, if yes, this is the way that we want to move. If, if it is the way we want to move, then that is how fares would be complete, uh, calculated on a permanent basis on the fair pay card. And if we want to move forward, then we would continue with the Title VI analysis, obtain public outreach and board approval. So we would fo follow our processes right now for approval. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be interested in hearing your feedback on this pilot as well as answering questions you have. Uh, qu questions on this and then staff reminded me that if we want to move forward on either of these pilots, we need to take some action so formally. So I, I'll mm -hmm. come back to the prior one, but let's, uh, any questions on this one? Well, it's uh, not exactly a question, more of a comment, but I, um, I'm a firm believer in the, uh, in doing this, this fair capping in the sense that people that are, have, you know, challenging revenue in, and it's maybe uneven, or it's just not enough to pay the cost of a monthly pass. I just think that this, can really be a game changer in the sense that they're not having to 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 worry about some of those issues. I I'm hoping that this will really give us some some better opportunities to really make sure that we're reaching people who can 
maximize you know and benefit the most from all of these types of changes so i'm i'm really looking forward to this one thank you right. i'm appreciative that we're taking advantage of our it infrastructure to, to enable this and and also to frankly move away from a cash-based system to the extent we can um i just think in the long term it'll be a lot more efficient for us and also save probably on some administrative costs in the long run. But, uh, uh, any concerns that you have, Jeff, on this one? No, I think uh, uh, it's it looks good. Um, you know, till you put it into practice, you really can't anticipate everything. But uh, you know, that's why you do a pilot program. So I'm excited to see what kind of results we get from it. Well, uh, seeing no concerns with at least moving forward with the pilot program itself, uh, could I, uh, on this particular one, and we'll go back to the other one here in a second, but on the fair capping pilot program, uh, could I have a motion to sure. approve? I'll make, a, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the pilot program at this time. I'll second. Okay. Yeah. I, have Sorry. A I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, uh, to approve the or capping pilot program. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. I'll step back uh, to item B on our agenda, the low income fair pilot program, uh, part two, as we know it. Um, uh, can I have a motion on that pilot? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the low pilot fair program, part two, as outlined. I'll second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, to uh, approve that pilot program. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, thanks, staff, for reminding me. Uh, Monica, anything else? No, that's all. I just I want to thank you for your support and especially um, my team and others in the organization. We've done a lot of work getting up to this approval point to have things in place to be able to move it forward. So we're excited and thank you again for your support. Yeah, absolutely. Keep us posted. Thanks uh, well done. to everybody for their efforts. Um, with that, I think that brings us to the conclusion uh, of our um, uh, uh, discussions. And it, it reminds us that our next meeting will be on December the 9th, at, again at 9 a.m. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we'll stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. And congratulations again, Jeff. Yep. Trustee Anderson. <laughs> Glad to be a part of the team. Thank you. Great.